arrangement here. Um, so at first I'm gonna ask a question that's just good to know, can you hear me? Maybe put a little yes in the chat box. Let me know if we're all streaming well to your ears. Um, and I will continue on. So tonight we are all here in celebration of Tracy O'Neill's brand new novel, uh, Quotients. So I like to go skip the bios and go into some wonderful words about the books. And so I'm gonna do that both for Tracy and for Charlie. So <laughs> I just saw something that made me laugh in the chat box, but I'll continue. Um, so no bias tonight, and here are some kind words about quotients. Tracy O'Neill has constructed the moving story of a young couple trying to build their lives within a divided and constantly dividing world of big data, small faith, political gaming, and unquantifiable fear. A superb and enlivening, enlivening exploration of paranoia and the search for intimacy, says Jonathan Lee of the author of High Dive. Vital and current, it is important to remember that in this world of instant connectivity, perhaps we are the engineers of our own loneliness and isolation. Perhaps we can listen to O'Neill and turn instead towards love, says the Brooklyn Rail. Tonight, Tracy will be in conversation with the author of Interior Chinatown, Charles Yu, or Charlie as we call him, or sometimes I call him the nicest man in literature or the nicest man in Hollywood. Here's some kind words about interior Chinatown. One of the funniest books of the year has arrived, a delicious, ambitious Hollywood satire, says the Washington Post. Charles Yu tells us about ourselves with his haunting depictions of the immigrant experience, familial relationships, and abiding desire to break from the pressures of conformity and live an authentic life. That's from the LA Times. Clearly, we have a lot to learn from both of these writers. Tonight, both books are on sale. You can see I'm pointing to a button. It's a really big, big green button that says bookshop. That's where you can find both of their books. You can also find any past um, guests of Room With A View too. So peruse, purchase, support independent bookstores. After I'm done rattling at you, Tracy will read for about five minutes and then we'll have these two beautiful minds discuss and chat and conversate. And then we're gonna take your questions. So then now I'm going to point you towards the ask a question button. We have two lined up. We want more um, upvote questions you care about and you like, and you see Bomb is starting out with their own question or our own question. So Tracy, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so happy to celebrate this book. Bomb is thrilled uh, to host you and Take it away. Guys, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much to BOM for hosting me. Um, there are so many people involved with BOM who I really adore. And it's been a really amazing venue for so many artists that I love and respect. So I'm grateful that we get to have this night. And I'm really grateful that Charlie is here to talk. Um, so I'm going to read just for a couple of minutes um, two short chapters from the book. Um, what you need to know going in is that um, there is a social media platform that's very similar to Facebook uh, called Cathexis in the book. Um, and so I'm going to um, read a section which is right before um, two of the characters, Alexandra and Jeremy are meant to get married. Chapter five. <clears throat> In the apartment, Alexandra pursed her lips, tidy, but her pulse was elaborate with wanting to know where he'd been. She was in one of her old college t-shirts and her legs were moist with lotion applied with the productive fervor of not knowing what to do, where he'd gone. He came to her, got on the couch. He put his head in her lap and she didn't touch him. I just needed to speak to a friend, he said. You needed to speak to a friend in the middle of the night outside? It wouldn't work to speak in the flat, he said. Because you can only speak secretly in secret places, she asked. Yes, he said. 
In the standing, her knee knocked his chin, and even then there was a flicker of wanting to reach out, apologize. But she did not apologize. She watched him touch his smarting face. What are you hiding? I'm not. You're not hiding as you speak secretly in secret places. He rounded through the spine, fingers laced. He leaned his forearms against his knees. Maybe I was nervous, he said. Don't be sore. Nervous. We're getting married, he said. It's normal. She braced her face, swallowed, holding the doorframe, stilt her hand. It was normal, his feeling, and it opened an eerie hole she did not want to peer through. She looked at her hands, now wrung smooth. I thought we were better than that. Chapter six. <clears throat> In the days that followed, she reviewed lives, the long scroll of them on Cathexis. Sometimes they were only sentiment without eloquence, but sometimes they were stunning little quadrangles recording seaside champagne occasions or a mother's recipe produced by her son. And Alexandra's gestures on the screen expressed her favor numbly, unstoppably. It was research for the new advertising job, or it was a very good excuse for it, the cough syrup haze of minor curiosity softening whatever it was between her and Jeremy. Jeremy had decided to pursue social work in New York and he would sit on and he would sit working on his graduate school applications and she could think across the room from him on the sofa with all these snips of celebration held in an electronic that it was not so difficult to live well. And she would crack open the silence, say, no one's told them only celebrities canoodle, everyone else hangs. He would have something not quite unkind to say that separated them from everyone else that made her believe that he was not so unsure after all that they would keep on together, clasped. There were two groups she didn't cathect into entirely. She was a lingering eye, a reader. They were people with addicts for daughters, or alcoholics, and they would write ragged accounts of their hurt, tell each other they knew how it felt, because they did, they did know, they did know because of their father or son. Better was the outcome sometimes, and she liked these strangers with bettered families best. She was sure she was not so miserable as the rest, because she only looked, and because too, though her brother Shell would miss the bugles of stargazer lilies in her hands as she took the aisle, the popcorn fuzz of baby's breath and her hair, they would be closer in America. They would not be so unredeemed, centrifugal. The night before the wedding, her friend Genevieve Bailey brought Alexander to a restaurant with fat seeping steaks and velvet curtains. The waiters wore starched garments. They replaced forks. For a long while, Genevieve and Alexandra remembered being younger and stupider, the romance of even ordering a drink, whiskey and Coca-Cola. Someone cleared the dishes. There were flakes of light in the rounds of their wine glasses. Genevieve spun the delicate stem of a flower between them. Never thought you'd end up across an ocean married, she said. A squat, tense pyramid of panna cotta came, served on a plate with mint leaves and berries. There were two little spoons on the plate. Alexandra concentrated on pulling a neat scoop. Who says I've ended up, she winked. Maybe this is just the beginning. The beginning of your husband's spree? Yes, serial wife Alexander Chen on the loose. Authorities say Chen is armed and dangerous. They will put you on the channel with the face eaters, Genevieve said. Yes, there will be terrible reenactments. They'll call you the spousal slut of the West. Alexandra scraped a bite of pina cotta. And you'll call me? Genevieve reached across the table for her hand. Often, and also my most infamous friend. Alexandra wished then that there was an architecture sophisticated enough to breach latitudes between London and New York, that distance could be miniaturized for more than representations, words, images. She would be unable to corroborate the substance of her friend's hand on another continent. Okay. <laughs> wow. Hey, Charlie. For Hi. Hi everyone. Thanks for that reading. That was excellent. Um, I, I'll just get out of the way. I was floored by your book. I think I wrote you a, <laughs> an email to that effect. It was just a, a blurt of pure uh, sort of enthusiasm. And I, I wrote Libby one too. I just was blown away by the book. And uh, I, I hope everyone you know here has read it. If not, um, 
obviously go read it right now. Um, I, you know, I think I want to start before we get to your reading and all that. Where are you in the world right now? I am in Brooklyn, New York, in my apartment overlooking the delightful BQE. Uh, what about you, Charlie? I am in Irvine, California, so mm -hmm. on the other coast, um, and overlooking my cul-de-sac. Um, and uh, it's, you know, probably a interesting time to be in New York. It's an interesting time to be anywhere in America right now. But uh, have you been able to get any work done or are you working on something? Um, you know, I take the view that uh, basically everything I do is writing. So if I'm walking the dog, I'm writing. If I'm playing Candy Crush, I am definitely writing. Um, so in that regard, yes, I think like, you know, for maybe this is true for a lot of writers, there's this feeling of ideas sort of like gestating um, in a sort of like subconscious way all the time. Um, but I haven't, uh, you know, I wouldn't say I have like a fuck ton of pages done. You know what I'm saying? I do. I do. Yeah. I've been working a lot on in the Candy Crush mode as well. So, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, hard at work. Um, level 641 was a tough one, but I got through it. Um, mm -hmm. I know I appreciate you saying that because I I take the same liberties with work as well. And I, I do think it's real work, but it's hard to justify that, you know, to my family and other people. <laughs> um, are you, I guess I'll just ask you the obvious question. Um, mm -hmm. Are you a spy? Well, a spy would never say if she was a spy, unless yeah. she was saying she was a spy, ironically, in tone, so that you would think she wasn't a spy. Right. Okay, I'm just going to make a note for my questionnaire here. Um, <laughs> you, you, you got a PhD from Columbia, is that right? I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that in it's spying? Fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what was it? Because how did you write this book? This is the uh, the question behind the question, because I imagine it either took a lot of research or you just have an inordinate amount of knowledge about a bunch of things, because I had to look up. I had to stop reading about, you know, twice a page to look things up. So <laughs> how, how did you write this book? OK, yeah, I mean, well, I was writing it while I was in the PhD program, actually. So I started this book the same year that I started the PhD. Um, and you know, I had I had met this guy who uh, said he was a spy, and I'd been really fascinated by his life. Um, and but he wouldn't really tell me anything about it, you know. And um, so that had sort of been the initial impetus to write this book. Um, but you know, as that was happening, you know, I was thinking really deeply about um, you know telecommunications, about journalism, um, about like what it means to be in this sort of hyper-connected world. Um, because the program that I was in, the PhD program that I was in, is in uh, communications. So it's sort of like journalism, media studies, but it's, it's like really interdisciplinary. And, you know, one point in the program, because uh, I could sort of like take classes in different places, um, you know, I, uh, took a military strategy class um, with this guy from Brookings. Um, and I, you know, got to work with uh, Helen Niesenbaum, who's a really interesting uh, analytical philosopher who thinks a lot about big data. So there's that, but then also I was doing research on my own, my friend Maggie, who you might've seen in the chat, um, I dragged to Northern Ireland with me, um, which um, I don't think she's forgiven me for yet, rightfully so. Um, as we got there and, and she was like, so are you gonna go to a library or something? And, uh, and I was like, no, I just sort of like needed to see what it felt like to be here. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, she said, you know, we could have, we could have gone somewhere else, but, um, yeah, it was, it was research that happened in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, sort of going back to your first question, it's like when you're working in a book, you always have that story like marinating in your brain in some way. And you're like picking up details in the world like it's almost as though your attention is always sort of turned toward finding 
you know, the little details. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and, and if I can back up half a step for those who haven't read it, um, in case there are any, can you, how I would, I'll give you my description of the book, my attempt at one, but I'd love to hear yours first because you, you actually wrote it. Oh no, I'm so, I, I'm so bad at this, you know, like I, I can't, you, <laughs> do, it. you do it, please. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I, I feel like the story is either a systems novel inside of a love story or a love story inside of a systems novel. I don't know how you feel about systems novel as a term. I have questions on that. But to, to me, I guess this sort of flap copy, you know, I, I'm not good at writing flap copy, but if I were to take a stab, it'd be Alexandra Chen and Jeremy Jordan are a young couple and they're finding their way, trying to start a family in a very paranoid time, you know, and I guess their past is coming back to haunt them in some ways and they're trying to live in the present. Um, th that's all very vague and abstract. I, I, I can't really even, you know, I could write an essay on it. I imagine people will write essays. Th they will probably write dissertations on cathexis, the fictional, you know, um, thing you invented, <laughs> but um, they'll, they'll have a cathexis about cathexis, I guess. But uh, <laughs> how would you how would you describe it? Which one came first? Is that the chicken and egg of it? Or do you, do you think of it, you know, or, or was it a was it always braided, you know, sort of together from the beginning? I think I think it was I think it was always braided. It was always knit in the sense that um, I knew that this was going to be from the beginning a narrative that's about this couple that's trying to create a life together. But I I also knew from the beginning that you know Jeremy was going to have this former life in intelligence work, um, and that that work itself. Um, would be um, such a large part of his um, psyche um, that it would be very difficult for them to have the relationship. Um, and I think like, you know, when we talk about the systems novel, it's like in, in a lot of ways, right? I was sort of taking that psychology, like that, that psychological structure, that emotional structure and imposing it on like a, a larger world, like a larger cast of characters in different ways. So, um, yeah, I do think of them as like really intimately entwined. And, and the book, you know, in a lot of ways being about the way in which these systems get in the way of um, of intimacy. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, ultimately I felt like it was um, such an intimate story and, you know, almost like sort of the the more that shared reality gets encroached upon the, the sort of smaller the real estate you have for the purse for the purely personal if there is even is that and it felt like you were really sort of navigating such an interesting intersection between how do you have trust within uh you know the most basic kind of trust with the person that you're going to start a family with um in in a time like this when i mean basic norms and basic sort of shared conventions of reality it seemed to be breaking down and and you managed to juggle two really difficult things um which you know i'll you know i i sort of wonder how in in the writing of it you i i read a great uh in, in bomb i wrote a great i read a great uh i guess interview slash essay um by i think it was nicole tresca wrote it for bomb and interviewed you and she um you said you said you cut something like seventy five thousand words out of the manuscript. I, I see your editor is here in the uh, in the chat, so I, I'd love to hear how that went. Um, if you're willing to talk about it, yeah, sure. I mean, this was a really really huge novel. It was you know it was over six hundred pages, and um, you know I was incredibly invested in a lot of different characters and their stories that are sort of in this narrative and what preceded it. And so um, I ended up, um, you know, when, when Mark bought the book, he had asked me to do some cutting, right? He wanted this to be a, a tighter narrative. And we got to have all these really, really fun editorial conversations, um, which, you know, I don't, I don't know how many writers in the room have had this, but um, I was just like, wow, this is like one of the like greatest conversations of my life. Like, you know, um, like so fun. So 
in any case, um, in one of our early conversations, um, Mark had said like, you know, that he could see the way that there was like a DeLillo influence in the book. Um, and also um, like shades of like Joan Didion um, as well. And I was like, yeah, those are two, those are two of my favorite writers. Um, and so when I was coming back to the book and trying to sort of pick up the pace a little bit in certain areas, um, I was thinking about Didion's political novels, these really short chapters, but the 75,000 words that were cut, I mean, it's like, it, it is all over the map, but quite a bit of it um, was the Northern Ireland stuff. So I think initially, um, something like 40 pages into the book, there was just suddenly this block of text that was like 120 pages in Northern Ireland. Like, here's Jeremy's past. And then like, you know, then it came back to um, the 2005 to 2014 uh, chronology. So, you know, I ended up really shrinking that down because, um, you know, it, it sort of changes the emotional momentum a little bit in the narrative, you know? Um, so I think those were really difficult sections for me to cut at first because I had done the research and um, in, in a lot of ways, like that's where some of like the big kind of like scene set pieces were um, that I felt excited about. But um, in the end, you know, I think like this is what made the book um, maintain a little bit more of the restless energy that I wanted to be there, you know, mm. so. It does have a real energy to it. I've, I, Delillo was, you know, uh, one of the first people that came to mind as of Delillo of White Noise specifically. I read that you love Endgame, I think. Um, but I don't know if you're a White Noise fan as well. Um, or Endzone, sorry, not Endgame. Endgame yeah. is an Avenger. I don't know if you like Endgame either. I mean, I love <laughs> Endgame, so we could talk about that as well. Um, Endzone. I haven't, um, you know, I haven't seen Endgame. Um, I do love Endzone. <laughs> um, yeah, I love Endzone. I love Libra. Like, um, Libra is probably my favorite DeLillo novel. Um, I like White Noise. Um, yeah, I mean, and there's a new, there's a new DeLillo coming. So I'm pretty excited about that. That was just announced, I think, like a day or two ago. So that's, wow. that's really cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I it's, you know, his work, I think, you know, people often talk about the, you know, the systems novel aspect, but also like his, his sentences are so beautiful. Um, and that was what first attracted me to his work. I didn't sort of like enter into reading DeLillo knowing anything that people said about him. So I, I didn't know that, uh, that that was sort of the popular interpretation of his work. I just sort of picked up one of his books accidentally off of a bookshelf at the New York Public Library. I was like, what is this ugly yellow book? It was Libra. Um, and I read, you know, I read a few sentences and I was like, wow, this, I don't know who this guy is, but he's great. And, um, and I thought, I, I pretty much thought I had just discovered Don DeLillo. Um, so <laughs> I was wrong, uh, but yeah. I discovered him in Berkeley in 1994, so I don't know if people know that, but I was the first person to discover Don DeLillo. Um, oh, I, I, we'll add that yeah. to your Wikipedia entry. <laughs> um, I, I should tell him that one of these days. Um, <laughs> I, no, I, your sentences, I, I, your, your prose reminds me of his in the sense that it almost feels um, truncated. You know, the, the diction sometimes cuts through in a way that's unexpected and other times leaves you wanting another word or two. And the net effect for me is to, is um, it, it's cerebral first, but then starts to accumulate into a feeling of um, something's being hidden or something's uh, uh, some kind of un unseen secret. And so, and I think that's how, for me, you create this kind of intimate space. Can you talk at all about on a sentence level, is this one, is this, are you going to write all your novels like this? I hope so. But if not, I mean, that's cool too. Like I've read your nonfiction. Obviously you, it'd be hard to write certain kinds of pieces <laughs> in the style of Libra or, or quotients. But I mean, is, is this something you developed that you, you know, how did this come about? I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, there are certain 
there are certain similarities um, in this book and my other book quotients in terms of the sentence level style um, with important differences that have to do with like the um, psychology of the of the characters. So um, for example, like one technique that I use um, in the hopeful much more so than in quotients is um, a syntactical move where um, I tend to, tended to place like the grammatical object at the beginning of the sentence instead of at the end, which is sort of more conventional. And that was very much a part of that character psychology of sort of always looking toward the future and always sort of um, moving toward these goals in a way that sometimes ended up um, like reversing the the order or the process of um, you know how one comes into being and and um, so in this book um, I was a little bit uh, that wasn't a technique that I used as much instead as you said you know there are a lot of moments in which there is um, the sentence is a little just like a little bit lopped off um, in also I think you know a circularity um, so you know, there are moments in which I'm trying to create this sort of like churning momentum through the sentence rhythms um, to push the narrative forward and just create a very sort of like subcutaneous sense of like unease or the sense that like there's just one more thing that um, needs to be known or something like that. Um, so a lot of it is sort of meant to work in a like a pretty subtle way um but yeah i am uh yeah i i mean i think that i'm i definitely think um in sentence uh pieces which is to say like i don't necessarily come to a sense of meaning and then um find the sentence for it it's like i'm moving through the sentence to push toward meaning if that makes sense it makes perfect sense i mean I, yeah it, it, it's very illuminating to hear you talk about it. I, you know, I read first, I think when I read, I read first as a writer and I'm sort of saying, how did they construct this right at the beginning of it, especially a novel, I think. And then if it if it's working, then I, I lapse into being a reader. And then maybe later on, I'll come back to being a writer. Like, oh, how did she do that? But in the middle, you know, for most of the enjoyable middle, I was reading this as a reader. And I think that the, the, the reason why is because you know, despite all of sort of the amazing craft that I think went into it and a lot of the sort of um, interesting subject matter at, at the core of it is are your characters who feel like, you know, recognizable people with real feelings, not sort of um, puppets and a sort of systemsy thing. And, and I, you know, I would love to hear you sort of talk about, um, I, you know, about Alexandra and Jeremy and and Shell and, and the characters and Tyrell and sort of how this story evolved for you, if you if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I was actually thinking coming into this event that I think maybe one thing that we might both be interested in a little bit with characters um, is uh, the avoidance of pain. Um, and one story of yours that I teach a lot, um, Charlie, is Standard Loneliness Package. Um, and so for people who haven't read this story, um, it's really wonderful. It's in this collection. And you should, all, you should also get these. But, um, but just for now, we're talking about a story in this collection. So, um, but yeah, so in Standard Loneliness Package, the characters, um, you know, are allowed to um, essentially buy um, sort of offshoring painful experiences to other people. So other people will experience their pain for them, right? And um, and so, th so the narrative is really sort of advanced through this idea that um, that many people want to avoid pain, right? And, um, and I think that the characters in Quotients um, are also looking to avoid pain. Um, and sometimes I think that has to do with um, a sort of failure of imagination um, that they can't quite imagine what a type of happiness would look like that could sort of exceed the world as they've come to know it. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm thinking about that 
especially with Jeremy, who's sort of like um, really in these cycles of violence through the world of um, military intelligence. Um, you know, I think it's true of Alexandra as well in a certain way, um, but a different one. Like Alexandra comes from a family um, where uh, there's been quite a bit of sort of like uh, Tangrams action, I would say, right? Like people coming in and out of, um, of this family. Um, and so she's sort of not sure where the, where alliances lie or like when allegiances will stick. Um, and then Tyrell, who you mentioned is a character who sort of appears later in the novel. He's, um, a, a young boy who Jeremy ends up working with, um, and, um, you know, Tyrell's father, um, it's sort of mentioned very quickly in the book, um, it, you know, has suffered a really terrible accident during the Iraq war. Um, so he's living in this household that's um, mostly women. It's his mom, it's his grandmother, it's his aunt. Um, and he has this very sort of like loving, happy family there. Um, but he also doesn't know what to do with like thinking about the world being so dangerous, like that your dad can just sort of get like wrenched out of your life this way. So he obsesses over numbers and specifically over um, like basketball statistics. Um, but even like he'll get a little bit excited about thinking about like grocery store deals as we all do. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess, uh, I'm not sure where I was going with this, except to say that, um, you know, these characters um, have these psychological structures that come both through choices in their personal lives, but also through that those overarching systems um, that create a sense of distrust and not knowing sort of what the true story is or, you know, where the sides are or when your words will be used against you or how your information will be used, um, so on and so forth. Do you, yes, uh, I am processing that as I, um, I, I, you said a bunch of things that I wish I had written down, but I didn't want to look like I was playing Candy Crush, so I didn't write them down and now I've forgotten what I was going to ask you. But what I am going to ask you now is, um, um, Talking about a systems novel, I thought this was a fascinating exchange uh, in your bomb interview mm -hmm. where if I can, I hope it's okay if I can read back your quote to you. Um, sure thing. <laughs> okay, just a little bit. If, this, if the systems novel has traditionally been associated with stories told by white men, perhaps it's because too often it's been assumed that books by women of color centering on racialized pain, especially in the private sphere, are the sum of what women are, of color are capable of. When of course we have more stories to tell rather than an inherent incompatibility between the systems novel and the requirements of representing life at the margins. I see the problem as less about this story form than a view in which our primary recommendation is construed as quote, authenticity. Um, I thought this was fascinating. I mean, this is to me, um, gets at a whole bunch of things. The main one being that there's a kind of dehumanization in, in the assumption that, you know, there's only one kind of story to be told, even as you're sort of encouraging a wider diversity of storytellers and points of view and stories being told. It's just another form of reductionism, I guess, or sort of marginalization in that sense. Um, I, you know, I don't know if I had a question so much as that you, in that sort of exchange, you illuminated something that I haven't been able to articulate. Uh, so well for myself in that there's a kind of invisible label and how did you feel i guess in writing this book um or did you even think about it did you just write you know what you wanted to write and with no barriers well i mean yeah i was i was writing what i wanted to write for sure but i would not say that i wasn't aware of what was expected of me, right? So, um, you know, I think that, especially in maybe the last five years, um, part of the conversation that's gotten very complicated um, 
or confused has been the conversation around own voices. Um, and so although um, in the literary world, we talk quite a bit about the requirement that um, the literary world become more diverse and um, that we see more representation. Um, I think what it often means is that the stories that, um, you know, writers at the margins are considered qualified to write are stories that either are about, um, you know, only their own cultures you know, things that happen, especially in the domestic sphere of their own cultures, um, or experiences of racism, um, so on and so forth. Um, and so I think one of the things about um, this book that I was thinking about is that, um, you know, I was very aware that I wasn't writing an own voices narrative exactly right i mean there's many characters in the book um there's i i don't actually know how many characters there are but it's it's quite diverse um but that's because um you know the world that i inhabit and that i think about is right like i don't only interact with asian american people um i live in new york city so <laughs> um that is um and i wanted to write about a globalized world and when you're writing about um surveillance, you're writing about the internet, you're writing about the sort of um, this sort of technological revolution that has changed the way that we communicate, the way we feel, the way that we understand ourselves. Um, that isn't something that's just happening to people who look like me. And, um, you know, for myself as well, I will say that just, you know, on a personal level, um, you know, I what I probably am not that qualified to write about, in fact, um, is a narrative that is set um, in a sort of um, silo of America, of Asian American culture, because I did not grow up that way. Um, you know, I, I'm adopted. Um, I grew up in New Hampshire. You know, my parents are from the Boston area and white. Um, so I am you know, I'm kind of looking at the um, breakdown of uh, these categories and the breakdown of these signifiers that to me register as false signifiers. And that's a little bit, in fact, I think what the book is about, right, um, is um, these various um, categories, failing people, um, this sort of like uh, quantified logic or very like simplified logic of um, that is sort of attached to say intelligence work or um, various other modes of knowing. So um, I don't know if that answers the question. But. It does. Yeah. And then some that yeah. was uh, that's fascinating. Um, did you ever work in and I, I just quick pause. I think I'm nearing the time where I'm going to be taking questions. So I'd love if anyone has any, please pop them into the question box there. Um, do, do you, um, do you have any background in either management consulting or image consulting, um, or any of the stuff that either Jeremy or Alexander did like the sort of world of, you know, big mega global corporations type work? No, <laughs> no. I, the only thing I've ever done besides, um, right and teach is, is bartend um but um <laughs> i did uh you know there, there's a book that uh sort of drove me toward putting alexandra in the t in the job that she has at the beginning of the book um and it's called branding the nation um and so it's about you know people whose 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 job is is nation branding right um and um but again you know i think that's like uh you know, the PhD program that I was in, those are sort of like the types of things that I was thinking about, but I haven't, I haven't worked as a, as a professional, only as a professional you, spy. <laughs> you did, okay, got it, yeah. you fooled me. Um, do you, um, and what are you, other than Candy Crush, what are you working on these days? If you're, if you're, uh, I mean, one, how has lockdown sort of changed your routines, your mental habits, or, or has it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, one of the ways that it has changed is that it has driven me to think about um, how 
cleared is that I have made my home just like a workspace, you know? Mm -hmm. and so I've been actually trying to do some things that are not work um, at home. Like I just, I just bought a sewing machine. Um, and uh, anyway, but I have been, I've been doing some work. <laughs> I've been doing some work, um, more sort of like researching and trying to just wrap my mind around the questions that I want to address in, in the next book. And so I have kind of two ideas and one is a novel idea. Um, so for that, I've been researching brain organoids, which are basically like, um, like miniaturized organs, like, you know, they're, you know, tissue, but they're not quite an organ. Um, they're really interesting though, because, um, you know, what has been discovered is that these brain organoids can register pain. Um, wow. And so it raises questions about um, what consciousness is and where it resides and how you sort of define what it is to sort of think and perceive and live. So um, that is one thing that I'm working on. And um, then I've been sort of thinking about this other um, memoir project. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where I am. So. That's really exciting. Um, yeah. Yeah. I see a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. We'll start with the first one. Is there a visual artist that you think of that influences your work or a musician or a filmmaker or film? Yeah, so um, there is a movie that um, I, I do think about uh, not infrequently when I'm writing. Um, and it's called uh, Ball of Fire. Um, it's a really old movie with um, Barbara Stanwyck and Gary Cooper and Billy Wilder wrote the script. And it's absolutely ridiculous. It's basically, um, there's this house that's just filled with a bunch of like fucking nerds and they're working on an encyclopedia. And um, so one of these nerds is a linguist and then he's told by, I don't know, the powers that be, the encyclopedic powers that be, that he needs to do um, like a section that includes like slang. So he goes on a research mission to go like try to learn about slang. He's a nerd. He doesn't know any slang. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he meets Barbara Stanwyck, who's like a like a lounge singer kind of person. And her name, like, you know, ludicrously enough, is Sugar Puss O'Shea. And <laughs> common name, yeah. Sure. Very common name, yeah. Like yeah, Nancy, <laughs> Karen, Sugar Puss O'Shea. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so she she like kind of teaches them about slang, and uh, there's like a crime plot involved too. So it's a it's a love story, but it's also sort of like a mob story and an encyclopedia story. Um, but the dialogue is uh, is like really juicy and fun, um, and I love their like I love their repartee in that movie. And I think that, um, in a very slight way, um, you know, like Alexandra and Jeremy in this book, like I sort of feel like I was trying to maybe register like oh, some shades of that, like some shades of like the sort of playful, um, witty banter kind of thing. There's definitely, yes, I, I loved it. Uh, there's definitely a pattern and a rhythm and a kind of, um, shorthand in the way that I think people that had, really care about each other, but also, um, you know, needle each other. Yeah, I think you nailed it. So it's it's interesting. I never would have guessed it came from Ball of Fire, but um, <laughs> that is fascinating. Um, how did you balance the PhD slash life slash adorable puppy? Oh, we have not talked about your puppy with your novel writing. So let's hear about this puppy. Yeah, Cowboy O'Neill. He's, he's a great guy. Um, we take the walks, um, which, as I said, that's writing. Um, yeah, he's 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 a good boy. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess if I'm really, if I'm very honest about it, and I'm not saying this in like a way that is meant to like romanticize or valorize, like I don't know, grit or any kind of like like neoliberal fantasy about like work or anything like that. You know, like really 
I didn't really balance it that well. I just like did really unhealthy shit, you know, <laughs> like, right. I just, yeah, like I just sort of like drove myself to the, the brink of a mental breakdown and then like stopped right before the mental breakdown. So um, that's what I would say about that. <laughs> that's the most honest answer I've ever heard to that question. I think that you have done a service to writers because at least to me, because I, <laughs> That's the answer I should always give, which is I did not balance it at all. It's completely imbalanced. Yeah. Uh, I don't know any other way to do it other than to be almost dysfunctionally imbalanced. Um, I don't start that way, but it gets that way eventually. And then that's when I end up doing the work, sadly. Um, when I'm like exercising and in a good state of mind, then I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm enjoying life, but I'm not actually producing anything interesting, sadly. Uh, right. Which is not to say it has to be that way for everyone, but it is that way. Um, what's been the most difficult aspect of writing fiction for you both when you first began writing versus now? What what do you what do you what, hate? What do you love? What do I hate? <laughs> what do I love? about writing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I I. I think I actually really enjoy um, pretty much all of it. I mean, I think the only part that I don't really like is like the waiting parts of writing, which is more not writing, but like publishing, you know? Mm -hmm. So like the part where you like send your, your agent, your manuscript, and then you wait to hear back about whether he thinks it's like a good book or send it out on submission. Those are the parts that I don't like, like all the business stuff I don't like. Um, but I, you know, I like all of the writing parts really. Like it's just like these cool puzzles that are in your head. Are you one of those people then that can produce work? Um, like you don't have bouts of writer's block that go on for extended periods of time? Oh no. I mean, yeah, there, no, there, there are like right now, you know, I'm not really like writing all that much. Um, cause I, I haven't like the voice hasn't made itself apparent to me, you mm -hmm. know, for the next novel. It's like, I, I have sort of some ideas, but it's like, I sort of need to get to that point where, you know, a few sentences string themselves together in my mind. And I'm like, that is the voice. And then I can move from there. And that hasn't happened yet. So this would also be, I guess, a waiting period, right? That is um, not the ideal part. Um, but yeah, what about you, Charles, Charlie? I hate it all. Uh, oh. I don't have writer's block so much as I, I, writer's block is the default state and writing is the anomaly. So if, if I squeeze a drop of writing out, that's a good day. Uh, most days, not much happens. Um, I think it's really interesting what you said about um, hearing the voice and, you know, stringing a few sentences together. Um, and I, I wonder if that resonates, you know, with other people in the, who are listening that, that write or, or, or might just be interested because that, to me, that matches up with my experience. Like I needed to hear, you know, in, in interior Chinatown, I heard like I struggled with the book for years and I wrote and threw away versions of this book that just will never see the light of day. Um, until I actually heard, a couple of sentences, then I actually understood it. It didn't magically then write itself, but I at least had a way in. I wondered, and so hearing you say that, I mean, with a book like this, it seems so daunting to read and to write. What was, I mean, if you're, you know, if you care to share it, what, what, what cracked it open? Like, what was the, where did the light kind of, you know, first come in there? Yeah, so I, I think that if I were to say like, one particular sentence, um, it it would probably be the first sentence, which is in the prologue. He found a small way to resolve the future, right? And, um, I think that was a sentence for me that got at, in many ways, like the central problem of the book and also this character and like the type of language that he would use, right? Resolve the future, which um, doesn't really make sense, right? But um, sounds as though it's, uh, you know, it, it registers in a certain formality. Um, mm. And um, it sounds as though it would be logical in some way, right? Um, yeah. So I think that, that that was it for me. What about you for Interior Chinatown? 
That's funny. Like, was... now, now I want to guess. <laughs> I can't. No, go ahead. What's your guess if you had one? I'm curious if you're willing to share it. Well, I mean, the only reason that I say this, well, I wonder because you repeat um, kind of works like a refrain in the book, right, is ever since you were a boy, you've dreamt of being Kung Fu guy, but I kind of don't think it is that. I don't, you know, will you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> I give um, it, it was that. You were right. It was? <laughs> it, it, yeah, it actually was that. Um, I, I was walking, I can actually see the, the place I was walking my dog when, when I, uh, when that sort of, that sentence fell out of my head. And uh, it, you know, I think in the same way, you know, resolving the future, it told, it told me something about the, the, the past and the present. It just had a whole bunch wrapped up in one little sentence. And it, it's a little sort of kernel, I guess, um, in which the novel is sort of a hiding um we have more questions um tracy did you change your mind about any of the ideas you engage with in this novel were you surprised by something you figured out or something that shift shifted or deepened um i mean i think that when i first started writing the novel i was more inclined to think about like problems of secrecy and privacy in a way in which I didn't necessarily understand the difference. So I think when I first started the novel, I was thinking a lot about, you know, Jeremy keeping secrets from Alexandra and Alexandra keeping secrets from Jeremy and not understanding that a secret is different than, than privacy. And as I worked through the narrative and was developing more characters and thinking uh, more deeply about like systems of surveillance, I started sort of developing um, a notion that privacy um, was different and that um, and that the way that secrecy is different from privacy um, has to do with, um, you know, like secrets generally um, are a secret from a particular entity or person, right, as opposed to privacy. Um, mm. Privacy isn't like directed at somebody. Um, and beyond being directed uh, sort of at uh, subverting somebody else's knowledge, it's um, there might be like a, a secondary purpose, right? There's like an ulterior motive. So um, that was something that I think changed as, um, as I kept working through this book. Hmm. It's really interesting. <clears throat> um, okay, there's one more question and then there's a comment for you. So I'll, I'll just get through this. Question for Charles. I'm a third of the way into the new book and I'm loving it. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, oh, the question's gone. Oh, there it is. Can you talk about how you developed the screenplay narrative voice? Was it challenging to sustain um, in ways that are different from styles you've used previously? Yes, it was very challenging. Uh, it was a, it was a, I wrestled with it for a while uh, because I was like, this is going to annoy some people. And based on uh, some feedback, it has annoyed some people, but <laughs> it, it was the organic form. I couldn't do it any other way. And so because of that, I knew it was the right thing to do um, because it's, you know, one of the few cases where form really dictates structure. I, I, sorry, form and substance were sort of synthesized together and I, I couldn't get around it. Um, so, um, but thanks for the, Thanks for reading it, and I hope you like the the last two thirds. And if you don't, just read the first third because that's where, <laughs> that's where I put all the work in. I just stopped after page eighty. Well, you know, one of the things I think is interesting about this form too is that, um, you know, like you often play with really unusual structures and like sort of meta narrational techniques. But it, you know, in this in this, I think that. Um, the ex the sort of way that exposition is handled is really different. Right, um, because mm -hmm. you have this sort of screenplay structure, and we have this character moving in and out of that screenplay, and um, understanding the idea of what his script is in different ways. Um, and I, I so loved that. Um, but I wonder. I guess maybe that might be one of the the ways that it seems like, from a craft point of view, it would be very different that there are parts where maybe you have to deal with exposition differently than say like, um, you know, this guy, which was my first Charles U. This is one that I like, really fell in love with 
first, um, which is very cool. And anyway, um, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna stop that. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I didn't have anything else to say. I, I just was sort of thinking about how that was maybe a point of difference. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. It was fun to have a device to be able to talk. You know front stage, backstage, on script, off script. I think if there's any kind of intersection between our two most recent books, that might be it in that you have characters who are on some level aware of, it's almost a self-consciousness, I guess, to the way that they're talking. I don't know if that it seems fair to you, but when Alexandra and Jeremy are talking, um, I thought you, you captured that uh, or rode that line really well in, in terms of making it feel like a real conversation, but also something that also feels like things are almost in quotes or an assumption that it's being recorded or surveilled on some level. Um, yeah. And so the very last thing I have to uh, say is Carolyn Henley in the chat says, I'm very intrigued by the two future projects you discussed, Tracy, as mm -hmm. well as your necklace. Um, do you want to talk about your two future projects, brain organoids or your necklace or memoir? Or are you going to combine all three into one screenplay and then sort of write that? Yeah, I'll I'll do that. I'll do the wardrobe as well. This is weird. It's um it's like a magnet. Oh, see now I did a crooked. There we go. I feel like that was <laughs> that was my comment in, uh, in return. All right. Um, well, we're so do you do you owe a book to your editor who's here, or are you, you know, writing? It free from constraints and then your book will arrive someday. I don't I don't I don't know anybody shit. <laughs> uh, Good. Yeah, so yeah, I guess um maybe I'll write another book. We'll see. <laughs> uh Mark is saying he wants your book, please. So um well I think I'm supposed to th thanks to everyone. I'm throwing it to Libby. Thanks so yeah. much, Tracy. Thank you. Libby, I think you're muted. Girl, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear you, Libby. Ah. Oh, Mark wants the necklace, I see. Um, he wants the necklace, oh, okay. Yeah. He can have the necklace too. <laughs> <laughs> we still can't hear you. No, I think you're saying amazing job, Tracy, and brilliant book, and thanks for everyone for coming, and thanks to Bomb Magazine and all the questions, um, and thank you so much. I mean, this was so much fun. I hope you had fun, Tracy. Thanks again thank for writing. You so much. One of the best things I've read in a long time. So I hope to. I'm gonna go read the hopeful, like this weekend. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Okay. I don't.